Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB foundation level sample paper discussions where we are talking about the tips and tricks and easy way of cracking through this examination in our first attempt. In this particular tutorial, we are still continuing with our chapter 4 talking about the test techniques and we shall look forward to some more questions related to the test techniques which would help you understand how exactly we can really relate the tips and tricks to that of these technique related questions. And to do that, the very next question we are covering today is question number 24 and it is talking about your test suite achieved 100% statement coverage. What is the consequence of this fact? Now, number one, at this point of time, we should look forward to recall what do we remember about statement coverage. Statement coverage is all about measure of all these statements in a particular given code with minimum number of test cases. See, in fact, there are two important things what we covered here. Number one is the statement testing as a technique and statement coverage as a measure. So if in case we have applied the technique, we would get minimum number of test cases for 100% coverage. But if we do not apply the technique, then we can also stand alone measure the required coverage. So your test suite has already achieved 100% test coverage. And what could be one of the consequences or what could be the outcome of that, which would be completely dependent on the options given here. So let's start with the options. The very first option here says A, each instruction in the code that contains a defect that has been executed at least once looks pretty good uh, with the given option, but I don't really understand the part of the defect here because uh, that sometimes creates a confusion that contains a defect. Does that make any sense, right? But however, each instruction in the code, basically, if you remember my tutorial, we told you that in a code, every single line is basically turning into a statement in the flowchart. So each instruction is what we are basically testing when it comes to the statement coverage. Let's look at the option B. And option B says any test suite containing more test cases than your test suite will also achieve 100% statement coverage. I think uh, this should be ruled out. The reason is uh, not just the count of test cases will always achieve 100% test uh, statement coverage, but uh, the type of tests which are written matters to us. So it's not necessary that you have got 100 test cases, but maybe those 100 test cases are not basically covering every single instruction in the code. And that is where it can become a little complicated to say that what exactly is the need of it, right? So it's not the count, it's not the amount of test cases, it's more about the one which are passing through every single instruction. So let's look at the next option here. The next option C says each path in the code has been executed at least once. Now each path is a different definition and different technique altogether because if you say path testing, that is covered in the advanced level test analyst syllabus, sorry, technical test analyst syllabus, you would find that, that this technique talks about all possible ways a test, uh, a particular code which can be executed. So it's not necessary that you're talking about the minimum number of test cases to cover all the statement. You're talking about minimum number of paths which can be executed with help of that particular code. So there could be loops, there could be if and else, and there could be while and when so there could be multiple iterations going through and that is where it could have different number of test cases. So C is path testing, not statement testing. And option D says uh, every combination of the input values has been tested at least once. Now this correlates to number one, uh, pairwise testing, where again pairwise testing is one of the advanced level topic in test analyst. But again, every combination takes us back to the concept of Principle number two, that is exhaustive testing is impossible. So some way we do not pick this as right answer. So both the ways, this is not the statement testing or statement coverage talks about. So if you say, uh, you know, considering all the four options, nothing seems to be right, but one is the most relevant answer that is looking A now. So let's look at this option once again, the option A says, each instruction in the code that contains a defect has been executed at least once. Now, seeing that word contains a defect is what we are trying to say is, of course, the reason you are testing is to find a defect. And the reason we are testing any single thing is to assume that you have a defect there. And that's the reason you are conducting defect because the common objective of testing is to find defects. And that's where we are predicting there's a defect. And that's the reason we are testing it. 
So in that context, this is where we have picked the most relevant option as A. So put together, the right answer for this particular question is A, each instruction in the code that contains a defect has been executed at least once. So let's not get diverted by the word contains a defect. This could be a little crazy sometime and diverting you from the right answer. So let's look at the next question. The next question we are having is question number 25 and it's talking about which of the following is not true for white box testing. I think this, we should keep it straightforward with respect to the option because the contexts are not clear. And all we are talking about is the given options based on that we can make a judgment that whether this is true or not. The question is about which of these is false. That means not true. The option A here says, during white box testing, the entire software implementation is considered. Of course, we told you is one of the benefit of applying white box test techniques in the syllabus that when black box testing techniques cannot be applied, white box could be savior in that situation. And as we talk about the white box test techniques being applied, irrespective of what which part of the code is implementing is getting covered in our executions. Because one way we're talking about 100% statement coverage, 100% decision coverage. So sometimes at the UI level, it's not necessary that every part of the code is getting executed. And that is where white box testing helps us to consider everything in the implementation. So this pretty much is true about having white box testing being applied. Option B says that white box coverage matrix can help identify additional test cases to increase the code coverage. Exactly true. We just now covered a question on the statement coverage. And if we find the statement coverage or decision coverage is poor, like 80%, 90%, then we can even figure out from this measure that uh, what additional test cases needs to be written in order to achieve the, in, or increase the coverage or achieve the 100% coverage. So this is also true with respect to white box testing. C says white box test techniques can be used in static testing. Of course. Why? Because static and dynamic are two different ways of doing testing. I can do it at the back end. I can do it at the front end. So it's not that static testing is only used for reviewing the documentation. You pretty much know we have static analysis, which is done at the code level. And I call that as code review. And yes, this is at the white box level. So that's pretty much applied to algorithms, flowcharts, uh, business model diagrams, and they are done all at the back end. It's not that there's a written documentation to support it. So that's pretty much another benefit of having white box testing. Whereas option D is the only one which is left out and option D says white box testing can help identify gaps in requirements implementation. That's one of the demerit or drawback of white box testing. We clearly mentioned this as one of the pointer when we were talking about the benefits of applying white box test technique. That is that when requirements are poorly defined, then only the implementation is what we measure using white box testing. But at the same time, if in case a requirement is not yet implemented, then it would be hard to predict what is missing here because we don't have specifications well defined. And that is where we said that white box testing may have this drawback. So in that context put together, the right answer for this particular question is D, that is, white box testing can help identify gaps in requirements implementation is not true about white box testing techniques. So let's look at the next question here. And the next question we are talking about is the error guessing. And uh, here the question says, number 26, which of the following best describes the concept behind error guessing? I think again, as usual, as far as the concept is given to you, you should start recalling what you have to better have the answers in your mind first because sometimes the options can be little deviating and uh, taking you away from the right answer so always have the uh, recollation in your mind with respect to what do you know about it uh, as much as possible before you look at the options now let's start looking at the option the option a says error guessing involves <clears throat> using your knowledge and experience of defects found in the past and typical errors made by developers. That's perfectly a match that this is what error guessing depends on as a basis. And also, we look forward to understand what common mistakes do the developers make as a part of the implementation. So having knowledge of uh, similar application testing, then domain knowledge, and knowledge of typical defects in such systems what are made is what becomes the basis for us. Similarly, let's look at the option B. 
Error guessing involves using your personal experience of development and errors you made as a developer. I think this is a little fancy option what I would call it as because a tester uh, probably may not have involved themselves into development. It's not mandatory for everyone. Second, you ut utilizing your experience of doing development would not certainly help you find the mistakes in the new product which you are testing. So here we are more worried about what the developer would have done as wrong in order to find and guess the errors. So it's not about what we could do as a developer in case we did somewhere somewhere in our life a little bit of development. So B is not relevant. If I talk about C, C says error guessing requires you to imagine that you are the user of the test object and to guess errors the user could make interacting with. This is one of the interesting options which I would like to highlight. Many people would tend to pick this one also as the right answer. The reason is it's talking about imitating the user perception and at the same time talking about that what the mistakes user would do, but people will not concentrate on the second part of it. That is why would users be considered for making their mistakes as a basis to guess the errors. Again, it is dependent on the developer's mistake, what they tend to do or where developers might go wrong is the basis for it, not what the users will do. That is usability issue and they need to learn about how to operate the system. So it's not about testing techniques. Okay, so that's a user friendliness. So C is not actually the right answer. It's the wrong answer. Okay, let's look at the option D. Option D says error guessing requires you to rapidly duplicate the development task to identify the sort of errors a development or developer might make. Again, duplicating is too much of work. Not necessarily a tester should re-implement the code just to try understanding that where all we can go wrong in order to guess the error. Error guessing is all about your past experience, the knowledge of domain, and where typically the product has failed in past, which is knowledge of typical defects, which would guide you with the <clears throat> most appropriate implementation of this technique. And that is where we can say that the right answer to this question is A, that is error guessing involves using your knowledge and experience of defects found in the past and typical errors made by the developers. And that pretty much makes it clear the way we should think and understand any particular question and derive the options meaning before we conclude with the right answer. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning. Thank you.